we're going to start on the 18th with, I think, 20 Little Compton residents. Right. And then the next Thursday, and I think they're going to try and keep those Thursdays going. And apparently the town has a list of who are the most vulnerable elders in our community. So they're going to start getting the vaccine first. All right, folks, I'm going to start this call to order. I'm going to do a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. <clears throat> Okay, folks, we're going to start our budget, our first budget workshop. I, anyone that's in the audience, you have a raise your hand feature, and I will be watching that like a hawk. So if I see your hand raised, I will get your question. I will call on you, and you can ask your question. And I'm very good at not interrupting the speaker and knowing exactly when to interrupt as you'll see. <laughs> so we are going to start now and we're going to go with John McNamee, I think. Right, John? And we're going to be, it's going to be on the screen so everyone can follow it. That's my understanding. Uh, yeah, you should be able to share your screen now, John, if you want to try. I want to introduce John. Go ahead. You want to, so any anyone uh, uh, the committee members or anyone in the audience, just raise your hand. I'll be watching. Patrick, if I may, uh, Chair. Oh, go right ahead. Yep. Uh, this is my third year introducing a budget, and I usually make a few opening remarks, um, and then hand it over to in the capable you know, capable hands of our uh, business manager. So thank you, everyone, for coming. I do believe that the budget that will be presented tonight, it is a draft, it's a working document, uh, that it reflects the vision um, that the school committee holds for Willa McMahon School and also um, our high school students. It um, is reasonable and it is fair and it supports all of the programming that has been in place well before any of us um, came to uh, these positions and also much, much of the new programming that we've put into place of the past two and a half years, most notably the programming that was added this year due to the pandemic. Um, I have to say a few things about our hybrid learning program and um, not one to want, you know, to compare us to other districts and, and boast because we, we do have an extraordinary staff and we do have resources um, to support everything we do. But yesterday I was um, on an errand and I ran into a mom. I always, you know, talk up parents of students, um, my own and, and everywhere else. And this was in another community. And I said, how's your, the year going with your middle schooler? Uh, and this is in Massachusetts. It's not in Rhode Island, not one of our neighbors. And she said, oh, gosh, you know, he's only on campus twice a week. And, um, and then she told me all the ways that her child was suffering. Uh, he was suffering in his, uh, the progress in terms of his learning. He was suffering um, socially and emotionally. He's an only child. And so he was pretty isolated and it's been, a um, the year's been a wash really for that family. And then she asked me about Little Compton. And I said, we have been in full in-person since September. Aside from one weekend where maybe five staff members were being tested and we took those three days for distance learning before the holiday break, we have been, and then after the holiday break, a few uh, days there, we have been in full force. 
our hybrid learning program with Promethean technology at its center is, as far as I'm concerned, the best in the state of Rhode Island and definitely in Massachusetts. Every day, our students tune in to their teachers and their specialists, whether they are at home because their parents and families chose to take the distance learning option or whether they're on site at Wilbur McMahon, socially distanced, masked, um, every day they are all learning the same thing in the same way. It's absolutely 100% synchronous. The Promethean technology certifies equity, whether kids are at home or on site. This is so unusual. We've gone well beyond GMEETS, well beyond um, any other modality with the Promethean boards. We gave our teachers an ambitious reopening plan and they not only implemented it with fidelity, they implemented it on their own time, climbing that learning curve um, during their planning periods, during their lunch periods, learning at least six new dashboards that I can count. At the very least, every single teacher learned six new complex instructional programs um, for their students. And it is because of the support of this town. Also, outdoor learning was absolutely a success throughout the fall and early winter with our three tents. We hope to put more up in the spring and we have to thank the town for supporting us in that area. We had three event tents from a local um, event specialty company and they withstood rain, wind, snow, and hail. And our students, our staff, they use them every single day. So when other districts are talking about, um, you know, learning being sort of constrained this year, uh, where there's been a lot of sliding, you know, a backslide in terms of skills and knowledge, um, that did not happen in Little Compton. We are seen as a standard bearer. As a matter of fact, we just picked up two tuition students from a community that is not very close to us, you know, proximity wise, based on our model, our hybrid model, that we can easily at a moment's notice shift from in-person to distance without any perceptible change other than the venue. So it took a lot of hard work. I have to thank John McNamee, I have to thank John Gabriel, Jonathan Gabriel. Uh, I have to thank every single teacher, Principal Whip, every um, support staff member. And um, once again, this wonderful body, the school committee, the budget committee, uh, the town council, if any of those members are tuning in. Um, last year we had, let's see, nine tuition students in a non-pandemic year. This year we have seven tuition students. So even though we're in a pandemic, we still have parents choosing to cross town lines, some of them crossing bridges and paying a tuition, a modest tuition. Um, but that is a testament to what this school has to offer. We've just received state level recognition for two of our new programs, Recess Rocks, Playworks New England reached out to me and Principal Whip to say that they will be recognizing our Re um, Recess Rocks program where all of our teaching assistants were trained and teachers were trained and also um, Noel Kiernan has sort of taken the lead um, on this. We also received statewide recognition for our social emo emotional learning programs. Uh, the Rhode Island Healthy Schools Coalition um, put us in the spotlight based on all that we have for our students to support them 
um, not only academically, but also socially, emotionally as well. And also um, interculturally, their development in areas of diversity and inclusion. So we are on track also um, to be an international baccalaureate middle school. This is our first year of candidacy. Um, we expect and we've been told that we are right on track. So June of 2022, we will be named an international baccalaureate middle school. I can't tell you how much work it is above and beyond um, our regular instructional program. And it's a good thing last year, nearly all of our middle school teachers were trained. They went to a conference in Boston. Um, they spent an entire weekend there. Very few people missed it because then after that, all of those trainings were shut down due to the, due to the pandemic. So we are going full bore um, to be the most innovative public middle school in the state of Rhode Island. The International Baccalaureate Program brings a global uh, lens to everything we do, a community service component to major units and lessons. Um, so we are a school on the move in spite of an international health crisis. And it is because of you, the public and the elected bodies of Little Compton. John, take it away. We're out of time now. Any questions on the... Um, share my screen. Uh, can everybody hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, John. I don't know about the rest of the folks, but I can. Okay. So just uh, a follow up on, on some of Laurie's comments and um, some of the investments that we've made, uh, certainly in technology, um, you know, the cost for the tents, uh, some of the PPE, we're able to get funding uh, from the state, uh, actually from, well, as a pass-through from the feds under the CARES Act. So it was about $72,000 that we did receive this year in, um, I think it was wisely invested. Uh, the distance learning certainly has been um, something that uh, based on other districts that I've seen is, is certainly um, superior, I think, um, based on what I've seen. And, um, and clearly um, as a pandemic, there, there are certain expenses that are going to be ongoing because we just don't know what's gonna happen next year. Uh, but I think that we have those um, under control in terms of, of what those are gonna, um, how they're gonna impact the district and the FY22 budget. So um, the superintendent did mention that this is a, uh, a work in progress and it is. There are four areas that, um, and I'll, I'll go through those when we go through the budget that are going to be impacted. Um, um, and, and tonight we'll discuss those and, and I'll give you some insight on those. But uh, for example, the Newport uh, County Regional Special Education Program, we don't have a final budget there. So there's an estimate that's included in here. So I'll highlight that as we go through. Uh, we had a discussion today with uh, uh, John Gabriel and with uh, the town officials relative to capital and funding of capital. And we'll have a discussion later on that as to how um, we might be able to fund that capital going forward. Uh, there are a couple of items that I'll have to adjust the budget for. There is a uh, the recent lease on the computers uh, I don't believe I have in the budget, so it's around uh, 8,000 a year. I'm gonna have to add that in, but uh, we'll be taking a few things out. And um, uh, Mrs. Dunn had, uh, had given me her medical expenses. She was hoping that she would get some funding um, from the state 
Uh, so we're going to have to add a little bit. I've got a placeholder in there, but we're going to have to increase that one a little bit. Um, and I, I suspect that there'll be other changes before we submit the budget to the town sometime um, towards the end of February. But uh, those are the items that are probably uh, uh, items that will be uh, changing uh, uh, as we go through the budget. So um, we, we start off with the enrollment and, and I'll also ask the superintendent to weigh in on this. Uh, we are looking at a uh, decrease in enrollment, um, the pre-K through eight um, in, in a lot of the districts, I think are looking at uh, reductions in enrollments as a result of um, um, the students that are being uh, taught at home. So the homeschoolers have impacted it. Uh, our rides well aware of this. Um, they know as, as the state education fund is based on enrollment, we're seeing um, ride uh, looking at uh, adding back the homeschoolers and not impacting districts. So they're well aware of the issues. The other, and, and, and those issues will impact um, uh, Little Compton not as much as the free and reduced because most students now are getting free and reduced um, the free lunches. So they're not doing the applications. A lot of the, some of the state aid is a bonus that the state pays for the free and reduced population. Um, they are looking at, looking at a three year average as a look back for the free and reduced. So they're well aware of these issues and I'm not uh, anticipating that they'll impact our, um, our state aid, but if you look at the enrollment uh, from K through eight, and especially if you look at grades, um, uh, if you look at FY20 grades four, five, and six, you would say that those grades would shift over in 21. And you could see that grade five is four less, uh, grade six is uh, two less than FY20 and grade seven is um, three less than what we had in grade six in, in FY20. And I think, Laurie, those are probably um, yes. homeschoolers. Right. We have 12 students, uh, K through eight, being homeschooled at this time. And Principal Whip um, feels that nine of those are COVID related. And I concur. And, and as, far, as far as the pre-K too, because uh, we're down on that, and I know that there were some issues with uh, the pre-K as well too. The pre-K has everything to do with distance learning. So we could not have an equal number of partners, peers. So we have, it's an integrated preschool. It's an inclusive preschool. So we have um, half the students usually have a learning vulnerability of some sort. And then the, the other half um, are peers. And we had to cut back on peers. We had to cut back on peers and focus on um, those students needing, needing um, early intervention, early intervening services. So we would have double the number of peers. So that's where the number, um, so if we bring back our homeschoolers who uh, chose that option, due to the pandemic and they all have valid reasons. We're up to maybe 230. Um, and then if we bring back a full complement of peers next year, we would be up to maybe 50, you know, let's see another six kids. So another seven kids or so. Um, so we would be up to not at, but near the 240 mark. 241. Okay. Yep. Got a quick, can, I, can I sneak a quick question in with like a hand raised from Roger Lord? Roger Lord, go ahead. You got something quick for me? Quick question? Sure. Yeah, I'd like to know if uh, the K through eight enrollment numbers includes the tuition students. Oh, they do. Yes. Yes, they do. Yep, they registered. They're in our student information system, Aspen, and they are full fledged members of our school community. Thank you. You're welcome, Roger. Okay, and, uh, and this is um, the high school enrollment. Uh, we're down from 118 to 102. 
uh, we're projecting um, uh, close to 100 for uh, FY22. So on the revenue side, a uh, state aid that we have in the budget is 432074, and that's the ride projection. Uh, as you know, th this number is not really solidified until May or June when the legislature votes on it. Um, but it was encouraging to see the increase. My understanding is at this point in time that we don't see any reason why the legislature wouldn't be approving and fully funding the state aid formula. Uh, so we are using that in our budget. Uh, if you recall FY21, uh, it was down um, to 397, uh, 611. Um, uh, and um, it, in FY20, they had actually, uh, that number was actually a little bit lower because they shorted us our state aid for June. Uh, so that number was probably closer to 367 in for FY20. Uh, but uh, we are looking to, um, uh, at 432.074, we're pretty comfortable that that would be the number that we'll come in at. Uh, on the town appropriation in this budget, what we're looking at is um, a total request, additional request from the town of, of 227.28, which is just slightly over 3%. Last year, we were at 1.85, the year before 2.259, and in 2019, we're a little over 3%. Now that number will get adjusted as we uh, adjust some of the expenditures. Um, and, and as, as we discuss those, we can see what impact that's going to have on, on that request. That's the number under state law that the uh, school committee can't submit a budget with an increase uh, higher than 4% of the um, prior year appropriation from the town. So that's why it's a key percentage that we look at when we're putting the budget together. Um, our total expenditures are um, 7,916,131 in the proposed budget, which is a, a, a little over a 3% increase in the, over the prior year. Uh, you can see that um, our expenses have been uh, around 2% with exception of, of 20. We were up uh, a little bit higher, 3.73, but we're at 3% now before Obviously, we, we make any adjustments to the budget. On the revenues, um, as I indicated, the increase in the state aid is about 26,808. We are projecting eight out of district student tuitions at uh, 6,000 per annum. Um, I believe we have right now, I, I'm not sure if we have two additional that came in in January. So we, we, we think we should be close to the eight as we go into the uh, FY22 year. And again, obviously the major funding source for the, on the revenue side is the town appropriation and, and that's uh, 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 220,728. The other revenues, which would be um, Medicaid revenue, um, we're looking at, uh, based on historical, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 19,000. It's not a big contributor, but um, that's pretty consistent with where we were in uh, prior years. So the big drivers, uh, and we'll go through some of the major expense categories now. The big driver is obviously our salaries and wages. Um, we're seeing there's really no increase in the number of full-time equivalents um, in FY22. The current um, collective bargaining agreement for the teachers calls for a wage increase of 2%. The non-certified bargaining unit expires at the end of uh, 21, and we're presently negotiating that um, number. Um, there is a placeholder in there um, at this point in time. Administrative salaries are based on the current contracts. So you can see that all these salary numbers are pretty much contractual. 
And uh, as you'll see later, we're, we're looking at uh, an increase in the sub-teacher costs in uh, all the districts are seeing some uh, increases in these. We, we have to pay a much higher daily rate in order to get subs. Uh, so I believe we're going, we're projecting, or we are actually projecting for FY22, 135 a day, which I believe is up from, uh, I believe we're at 100 a day, Lori in the past for subs? We did raise it to 135. Yeah. But, you know, I know Lincoln raised theirs to 140. We needed to uh, attract a wider pool and, and it did work. We do have a solid cohort of subs where most districts do not. And the sub environment has changed now because now even if you do distance learning and you may have a teacher that might be out quarantining, you still need to have a sub in the classroom right. with, 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 the, with the students, even right. though the teacher might be teaching from home. So, it's, Absolutely, uh, John. John is correct. So we've had several teachers who had to quarantine because they were close contact to a, po a confirmed positive case or maybe even a positive case himself, herself, or their self. Uh, that's not important. But so we've had several teachers quarantine and we had to put subs in those classrooms. Uh, the teachers um, pushed out to the kids, in, the teachers at home, delivering all of um, the lessons, you know, from their home office or wherever. The kids are in the classroom, some kids are at home, distance learning, it's all synchronous in real time. And so, um, yeah, we, we've had to really um, be creative in, in how we pulled all that off. And I think the increase in sub pay um, was definitely a factor. And we're gonna feel it though at the end of the year. And, and there's no way to dial that back moving forward. Um, that's for sure. We'll feel it next year as well. And clearly, salaries are a huge part of the budget, probably over 45%. So you can see that, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room when you have uh, contractual obligations on the salary side. On the fringe benefit side, um, we did, uh, we have been contacted. The Rhode Island Interlocal Trust provides uh, our, our health care. They've um, sent out a recommendation for. Uh, increases um, the health care this year they're looking at a range of six to nine percent and on the dental they were looking at um, I think three to five percent I, I did have some discussions with the town in terms of what they because they use a the trust as well as to what we would be using um, we, we kind of settled in on the seven percent uh, for healthcare and the 5% on the dental. We'll probably have some solid rates sometime in April. In the past, uh, although last year, I think we had some um, latitude to wind up changing um, some of the numbers because we got uh, a reduction in, in actually our rates from FY20 to FY21 on the health side. So these projections are, um, uh, realistic at this point in time. Um, generally, most of the healthcare consultants that I've sp spoken with, they, they're saying that healthcare rates are generally a 7% increase on an annual basis, some years less, some years more, but on average. So that's why, um, you know, we kind of settled in on the seven, but we, we may we may be able to adjust, adjust, uh, adjust those as we go forward, but that's what's in the, um, in the budget. The co-share is 20% for teachers, 18% for non-certified and administrative. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, there is an increase in the teacher pension contribution rate of 0.38%. We, we currently contribute at 14.5% uh, of teacher compensation. It's going up to 14.88 uh, starting in FY22. Uh, so there is a little bit of an increase in the pension contribution. 
And um, the other items that are included in fringe benefit are uh, payroll taxes and uh, your defined contribution pension expense for teachers, which is your TIAA PREF. Those are all payroll based. So as your payroll increases, you're looking for a converse, uh, you're looking for uh, increases in those areas based on the payroll increases. So that's making up the, uh, the additional increases in the fringe benefits. And, and those probably, you're probably looking at uh, close to 20% uh, of, of your budget being in the fringe benefit side. Um, you're out of district tuitions, uh, you know, obviously Portsmouth High School, um, we're looking at 100 students, a tuition of 10,471, which is about a 1.24% increase, uh, which is the cost of living increase. Uh, that number is probably somewhere over a million dollars, a million oh fifty nine, I think is what we have in the budget. So again, uh, that's a number that's uh, that's contractual. Um, you don't have a, a lot of wiggle room with that. Uh, special education. Um, this is kind of an estimate. Uh, we uh, we have some discussions with the collaborative in terms of assessing out of district uh, students. And um, we budgeted uh, $84,000 in the current year for um, that particular number. We also have out of district uh, tuitions for vocational ed. Right now, what I've done is take the, the current student population looking at those students that are um, graduating. So we're projecting to have four students out of district, one at the Met, two at Newport Career and Tech. And we have one student that's at Tivin and uh, I, I believe they may have been a sophomore last year. So I, I've left them in at that program. Uh, so that makes up the overall vocational ed tuitions. So out, out of district is, is made up of uh, the Portsmouth High School, to, uh, which is a, a fairly big number your special education and your um, CTE programs, your vocational education programs. Um, on the Newport uh, County Regional uh, Special Education, uh, we've, we've, um, we've met, or the business managers met uh, probably a couple of weeks ago. They're in the process of, of putting a funding together. Um, I, I put a early estimate in there for, um, I think a five or six percent increase over what we were charged last year. Uh, so that gross would be 364,000. We do have federal grant funding in our IDEA Part B. A portion of it goes to cover this tuition as well as um, the IDE, uh, IDEA preschool grant. So it's like $96,000 that offsets the 364. So what we're looking at is a, a net number of about 268 that's being charged to the general operating budget, which you'll see in, in this year's budget, which is an increase of about 24,000 over FY21. I'm hoping that we could see some budget numbers uh, within the next few weeks so we can uh, look and adjust that uh, once those numbers come in. But, uh, that's a reasonable estimate at this point in time. Um, busing, uh, we're in year one of a three-year contract. Um, that contract is actually uh, three years plus two one-year options. Uh, the contract calls for a increase of 3% per year on the daily bus uh, rates. We have six buses plus a midday pre-K run and we run one late bus coming out of um, Portsmouth. There's additional costs in there for busing, which is for fuel surcharges, athletic and extracurricular events. Those numbers are based on where we were in FY19 and 20, uh, because last year, obviously after March 13th, we didn't have a lot of busing that was, was going on. And uh, of course this year we didn't have any athletics as well. So that, that had an impact on that. 
Uh, bus monitors under the ride uh, regulations were required to have bus monitors on all K25 bus runs. So um, those are somewhere between four and five hours per day per bus. Uh, so that comes out to roughly 41 hours, uh, 4,100 hours per year. And the contracted rate uh, for a bus monitor, is, which is what we pay the bus company, is, is 27.15 per hour. On the utility costs, um, we are, uh, you can see here, um, the electricity is certainly one of our big uh, components on, on, uh, on the cost side. Right around the time of the shutdown of the pandemic, I was working with the town to enter into a um, thought the virtual net metering process. So. That process um, takes about six to nine months to put together. And what it does is that uh, you enter into a contract with a provider of green energy. So any community that's providing green energy through uh, a solar field, we have the ability to buy that energy. And what happens is they sell that energy back to the grid we wind up getting a credit on our uh, energy bill for the purchase of that. So there's a certain amount of money that we wind up paying for that. But then we wind up getting a credit on our bill uh, for that uh, energy cost. I can tell you, we use this in, in Lincoln and uh, the average savings has been between 35 and 40%. And that's what the Department of, the uh, Renowned Department of uh, Energy had communicated to to myself and uh, Tony Texera when we we had a discussion with them. So uh, I've spoken with Tony. We're going to start to get that process going again. I just don't know if the if any, anybody at the state is is able to reinvent it, but we'll we'll get that going. It it does take you know six to nine months. So I haven't impacted that budget. For FY22, but I'm hoping that if we can get something in by the end of the year, we could see some uh, at least some savings in the second half of uh, FY22. Uh, fuel oil is kind of based on an average number of, uh, of gallons used. Uh, you can see there are major fluctuations because sometimes they, in the past, if depending on the price, they'll drop. If it's a 5,000 gallon tank, sometimes they'll drop oil in there in June, if it's if the price is a good number. Uh, so sometimes it's just timing that causes that fluctuation and that uh, cost. And then the diesel we use for generator and propane we use for hot water heating. So that's kind of running. Um, it was actually closer to 3,800 in FY20. We uh, we're at 3,500 in FY22, but. Um, we'll see if we can kind of hit that, but that's not a, a big number when it comes to the overall utility cost. On the curriculum side, um, we've got, um, these are the line items that kind of spread out throughout, um, but these are the items that we're looking at in terms of our overall curriculum with the exception of medical supplies. I don't know why I put that one in there, but it is. That number uh, of 2,200 is probably gonna be closer to 5,000 based on the uh, numbers that I got from Mrs. Dunn. So I'll make that change for the next go around. Uh, supplies, educational supplies, um, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly consistent. Um, some of the changes uh, have to do maybe with some classifications because not everything would be a textbook. Sometimes it's a general educational supply. So I'll be classifying that up in the supplies area uh, as opposed to in the textbooks, which is kind of more of a just straight curriculum expenditure. Um, so we're looking at uh, a total budget of 1064 compared to last year, which we we're looking at uh, ending the year at 101. So we're looking at a, a, a small increase in that. Um, there is uh, some potential if we were to get some additional uh, CARES Act money that there could be some programs um, that we could be funding with 
um, uh, some some um, some COVID relief funds. Uh, but at this point, we haven't factored that into the budget at all. And uh, finally, the, the other large item, and this is one that can impact the budget, is the capital outlays. And um, uh, John Gabriel has submitted this budget. And we've, we've had some conversations. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into a little bit more detail in the capital outlays. But so we, we're looking at uh, an upgrade to the voice over internet uh, protocol phone system that we have in place uh, for 16,000. Um, generally, we did have a discussion today about the potential of maybe deferring that into next year. Uh, so we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, he's got some uh, security and alarm upgrades. I believe there might be some cameras in there, John. That's at 24,000. The other big item is uh, 50,000 for a gymatorium upgrades, which includes sound, lighting, and video. And um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, potentially uh, having uh, the town put that into their um, capital budget uh, to fund that because that particular uh, area would be more of a community space as opposed to strictly an educational space. So I, I have had some discussions with, um, uh, with the town administrator about putting that into the a town capital budget. And then we have some network uh, upgrades for 15,586. Uh, the other uh, item on capital is uh, technology. So we're looking at some uh, Chromebook purchases, uh, about 23. Um, we've got some additional uh, controllers for distance learning, 11, a little over 11, five, a little less than 11, five. We've got some uh, Windows refreshes on some of the computers for close to 14, and then we're doing some upgrades on the uh, commons and then the conference rooms for about seven grand. So, so those are the kind of the highlights of the, um, of the budget, and I just wanted to go over that at a little bit higher level and certainly I'll entertain any questions. What I'll, I'll probably do is kind of go through the um, budget as I present the financial statements on a monthly basis in that particular format. Uh, I'll go through those and kind of explain the detail that you all have in your packets that, that support the, uh, the various items um, in the budget. Uh, but at this point, if there's any particular questions, we can we can go through those. Um, but I will have uh, John go through his technical budget when we get to that too, and we can have a discussion about um, some of the areas that I think we can we can wind up um, looking to defer into FY23 and 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 kind of reduce the impact of the request from the town that we'd be looking at. So Patrick, I don't know if there's any questions at this point. Thank you, John. Any questions for John at this point? I'm not seeing any. Okay, so I will um, So help me out here, John. I'm gonna get back to my computer here to- uh, Try and escape on the keyboard. I, I do know where that is, John. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good thing he's here. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the budget package. And um, oh, sorry, what, John. Uh, yep. Uh, we might have to stop screen sharing and start it again. I think you just shared the other PowerPoint. Okay, so let me uh, start. Okay. All right, so this is the budget, preliminary budget that, um, uh, so you've got my executive summary, which we've kind of gone through um, based on the, um, the PowerPoint. So this is the, uh, uh, 
the revenue side, this is the um, adjusted budget, the uh, year-end projections and the preliminary budget. Uh, these, this is also the handout that the public has at this point as well too. So I'll just, I'll just focus in on that and I'll, I'll, I'll go through some detail as we go through here. So we we pretty much have gone through the uh, the revenue side. I don't know if there's any particular questions. We 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 know that we're looking at uh, eight uh, students out of district. Tuition rate is remaining the same at six thousand. This year, forty eight thousand. We got the nineteen in there for the Medicaid. Uh, we got the state aid at the four thirty two or seventy four, and obviously the plug number to balance it is going to be that uh, the town appropriation, which includes a $220,000 increase. So, um, uh, so on the, on the salary side, um, we pretty much, one of the items that you can focus in on is that, um, that line three, five, one, 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 five substitute. And this is what we were talking about. Um, so last year, if you look at the uh, adjusted budget, we were like 1059. So that substitute line item covered all your day-to-day -day subs for teachers that it might have been out, any professional development um, subs that would be needed for teachers that are going out on PD. There was a little bit of normalcy in that. We, we were probably running anywhere from you know, 90 to, to the 105 in the past years. And what I did is I based it on the average number of days that we would need subs for. And, and considering that that also was at $100 a day, we're looking at uh, an increase to 135 a day. So I think we're gonna be much closer to where we're gonna wind up this year at uh, next year. So you'll see a little bit of an increase in, in that line item. The other items, the miscellaneous items for stipends and everything are really based on um, the FY20 year because that's gonna be, I'm assuming that we're gonna have some after school programs next year. We'll have extracurricular, we'll have, um, um, you know, athletics. So uh, <laughs> Lori's crossing her fingers in, uh, so those have all been factored into the budget. So we haven't adjusted any of the expenses for programs that we don't think we're going to run. Um, we don't have, um, like most districts might have an extended school year for, um, um, uh, for certain students. Um, we don't have that. Um, you know, I am anticipating that in, in my other district that we'll be doing that live, but that could be virtual, uh, who knows? But so at this point, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable on the on the salary number and where we're gonna wind up in that area. If you look at the next uh, group, the employee related salary costs, uh, you can see uh, there's a big increase in um, your medical premiums. You go from um, a, a budget of 599 to 679. So that is not only the 7% seven, um, 7 increase, but there's also a change in the number of, of uh, people that are covered. So we went, we have one less individual, but two more families. So we have a, a little bit of a bump in the, in the number of, 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 of people that are covered, but we also have that 7% increase in there. And uh, that's net of the co-shares. And as I indicated, those co-shares at 18 and 20% for the non-certified and the certified respectively is, is already netted out of that number. Um, really, uh, you know, you get a teacher's pension that that's a function of the increases in salaries plus the increases in rate. You can see we're at 388, we go to 416.3. And then you'll see some increases in your FICAR and Medicare that are the result of increases in um, uh, salaries. The workers' comp, um, I've kind of kept that the same. We, we did have um, a, a, a mod rate that it impacted that in prior years. I think that's going to wind up 
uh, working itself out. So uh, I think we'll be uh, closer to that uh, 26,000 rate. So I'm not expecting a, a big uh, jump in that. But that gives us, you know, a million um, 363. So, I mean, if you look at um, both the, um, the salaries, which are, um, let's say, uh, 3610 plus the uh, 1363. So that's a 4,973 in cost. Um, uh, on a total budget of um, 7916. So there's almost 63% of your budget that's sitting in salaries and um, in fringe benefit. And, and, and like I said, those are pretty much contractual. So you can see that with education budgets, it's it's very difficult to move the needle unless you're moving anything within those particular line items. Uh, the next group of expenses are your technical and professional services. Uh, included in those would be your um, the bus monitors, as we indicated. Um, that that's one hundred ten thousand. That's the largest expense in there. Uh, that is uh, based on the 4,100. And again, that's, um, that's a number that you could go to ride with and you could get, you could try to get a, um, a waiver, but um, clearly with, um, you know, the, the bus routes and the students um, it, with the way the town is set up, it's certainly not something that I would recommend at this point, but, um, you know, the web-based programs, uh, John will go through some of those, those are included in his budget. Um, all the other ones, uh, you've got legal in there, you've got the, the auditing at 26, you've got the legal in there at 30. The other services would be uh, the uh, compensation to myself, at 31.5, you've got your dentists and uh, school physicians in there. Um, the other technical services, John will go through there. There's some of that that's in the budget. Uh, also included in that would be, um, which is the 44.502, is uh, the money that we pay for the uh, maintenance on the accounting program. Uh, that's included in there. Uh, and the data processing services, those are the fees that we pay to the uh, payroll company for the processing of the payroll. So that comes to about 300 and almost 311,000, uh, not a big increase over, um, over the prior years. Um, the next uh, purchase property services, um, we're looking at um, rubbish disposal, groundskeeping, you know, some of the utility expenses for water, telephone, wireless communications. Those come to uh, the adjusted budget in FY21 was 109.8. We're looking at an increase to 125.340. We do have a little bit of an increase in uh, rental of equipment. We're uh, adding a lease for some uh, printers as opposed to to buying those out uh, was more economical and less impact on the budget to lease those. You do have, uh, here's where you do have your, some of your contracted services for electrical, HVAC and plumbing. Um, I haven't seen too many big invoices on the, uh, on the HVAC. I think uh, uh, what we did on the boiler in the past uh, we obviously replaced one boiler and we kind of tweaked the other one. So I haven't heard too much related to that. On the rubbish disposal services, we actually had some good news today. Um, the town uses um, Republic, which we use as well. And I happened to be, um, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, I think it was last week actually, 
Tony Texera was telling me about how he's um, got a new, he's entering in a new contract with Republic. And I said to him, well, we use them too. Can't we get in on that? And so he, he called up the woman that was de he was dealing with and they said, sure. So we wound up uh, cutting our uh, rubbish pickup service almost in half. So it, we're saving uh, 432 a month, 5,000 a year on that number that hasn't been impacted in on this number either but uh so that was that was good news so i've been giving tony a few kudos for uh, for helping us out in that regard but that's some of the benefits to, as we work together with the school and the town to try to you know save some money as we go forward um i think that kind of covers everything i mean the the, the alarm and fire safety services we have quarterly manual inspections on the on the fire alarms and on the um, uh, the fire um, system itself. So those are kind of mandatory and we have uh, asbestos inspections and lead inspections. And so those are all included in, in those numbers. The next the group of accounts, which is the purchased other services uh, down at the bottom of that page, um, you know, you're, you're obviously you're busking is is a, a big number and and that one per contract will increase by uh, by three percent you've got your property liability insurance in there which is uh, kind of an estimate at this point in time i think i've got a, a five percent increase in there um portsmouth high school tuition which we went over 100 students plus the library um monies I think I've got that budgeting for about uh, 12,000. So it's a million oh forty seven for tuition, 12,000 for the library, 61.4 for the voc ed. So the four students that we talked about earlier, that would be the vocational education um, tuition and our out of district special education, looking at uh, somewhere around 84,000 and again, you know, that, that could change at a moment's notice. So, but um, uh, we do have 84,000. And uh, with the um, the Newport County Reg uh, uh, Special Ed, which is that last line, line is 268. That is the number that is uh, the early estimate, and that's net of the funding that we get from the IDEA grants. So we're hoping that that um, will be pretty close to that number. We do have about um, thirty thousand dollars of equity, if I want to put it that way, at the collaborative. So there's a fund balance that has been generated over there that we have available to us. And um, that's a number that I think you leave in reserve in the event that you wind up getting uh, a particular uh, event, um, especially on the special education side that requires some uh, unusual expenditures. Uh, I wouldn't recommend bringing that in uh, under these circumstances because I think it's uh, like I said that that could change at a moment's notice. So, um, I'm saving the best for last. So I'll, I'll save John until we get into the uh, the uh, equipment in the. Uh, and the technology costs, because those numbers, obviously, you'll see are, are, are substantially increased. Uh, we talked about these, uh, the materials and supplies, um, which uh, is on page nine of, of the, uh, the book. Uh, that is um, about 207,400, a little bit of an increase over the, um, the budget a little bit less than where we were last year. Um, there's, there's probably a little bit of, of COVID expenses. I, I did a lot of there, um, but um, we've gone all over those. There's nothing unusual. 
in these line items here. The, the next category, and this is where I'll have uh, Mr. Gabriel weigh in, is that on the, on the equipment uh, we went through earlier, there's 105, 600. Uh, we've got 65, six for technology hardware and uh, another 11,000. So we're at 182.2, which is an increase over last year's of 107,726. We think that um, as John and I spoke today, there's some of that technology hardware that was in last year's budget that we're able to fund through the COVID money, the ESSER fund, I believe that was about $33,000. Um, and we do have some uh, REIT grant uh, money that we were able to use to fund some of that technology. So we think that the improvements uh, to the um, gymatorium that we had budgeted for FY21 that we were going to do through a lease, uh, we might be able to put into the budget and not have to do the lease and have the ongoing expense. So that's, that's, that's a good that's a good thing for last year. Um, so this year uh, we've got uh, in the 105.6, uh, as you know, we had the 50,000 for the update for the, um, the uh, equipment, I mean, for the gymatorium. So I have spoken to, um, uh, to, to Tony Texera about putting that into the town capital budget for a couple of reasons. One, it, it gets it out of uh, maintenance of efforts. So it's not something that the town then has built into the monies that they're giving the school on an annual basis. And the reality is that the uh, some of the changes or most of the changes are, are going to be um, items that the community can take advantage of. So it's not just going to be for the uh, for the school side, so um, I, you know he he was receptive to that. What that will allow us to do is pull fifty thousand out of the budget here, reduce that uh, request from the town, which hopefully will bring us down closer to somewhere between the two and the two and a half percent, which I think what we we'd like to shoot for. Uh, I did talk to John about the telephone and trying to defer that into next year too. Um, the other thing is we would we would probably have to add about 8,000 for the lease on the computers that that um, that we've left out there. So I, I spoke to the superintendent about uh, putting a formal request into the town. Um, and uh, so we'll get a letter over to uh, to town council president Mushin and Tony uh, making that uh, yes, that yeah. formal request upon approval from the uh, certainly from the school committee, uh, and I think that would make some sense. Joe, so, back to me. Uh, can, I, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. Got a question from Tim Brown. Substitute teacher costs is budgeted one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. This is this. Is that an accurate number based on the 135 day rate? Uh, yes. Answer to that, Mr. Brown, is yes. Well, it's, it's based on FY20, uh, FY20's budget, which was the number of days that we traditionally had used for subs times the new rate. Yeah, so that's a good rate. That's a good number anyway. You're welcome. So, John, do you want to go through your budget now? And before you do that, John, Tim Brown, can you just type your address in there for the record? I'm getting a question from our clerk on that. Anyone who asks a question, Roger Lord, too. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was remiss in saying that. Thank you. you do it anytime. Any. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Uh, so uh, I was just asking John if he wanted to go through the technology budget because uh, that certainly has a, a, a significant impact on, uh, on what we're looking at tonight. 
So do I sh stop sharing my screen here, John? Uh, if you want to, I can, uh, I'll pop mine in there. Um, one well, I have yours here. on, I have yours on mine too, if you want me to just scroll down to it. Uh, oh, that's fine too, if you want to do that. Yeah, I'll do that. I think I'm capable of doing that. <laughs> you have a lot of pages there. Yeah. Okay, so this is the this is page one. Start okay, perfect. I, I can just I'll start right at the top, I guess, unless anybody has. Um, but feel free to interrupt if you have any questions or, or anything like that. Um, but otherwise, um, so all of these are subsets of something John has already covered and are reflected in the above numbers. And and I just want to be clear, John, um, in the 2022 proposed numbers that we just talked about, the capital outlay that was still including the um, the gym upgrades and the phone system, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. All yep. right. I just wanted to make sure. So that combined would yep. be another sixty-six thousand off of that one hundred and eighty-two number for what is, it, what is that one hundred and sixteen? Um, if if but we we'll did have to move those out of the budget, yeah, we can we can get down to those when you talk about that. Yep. Definitely. Um, so so the first one then um, web-based supplemental instructional programs is largely the tools that teachers use every single day um, with the kids. Um, and, and I'll just kind of quickly go down the list. Um, and again, I'll, I'll actually let me bring up the Q&A to make sure we can see in case anybody else has a question. Um, the, so Achieve 3000 uh, is probably one of the bigger ones on there. That is um, our literacy software, which I believe came up. Um, we, we had a lot of questions uh, last budget committee uh, meeting last year about that one. Um, and the, that was the woman who came down to kind of give an overview of that. Um, that provides individualized, um, like customized written um, texts for kids to read and um, questions that they would answer based off of that, customized to every single individual learner. So while that is our one of our biggest expenses, it's also one of the most complicated pieces of software we rely on, um, definitely. Um, Bookflix is, um, is, is a tool used mostly in the lower grades, um, reading and, and literacy type stuff uh, where they narrate along to books. Um, Dreambox is a, an online math program. Um, Quaver is our music curriculum um, educational software. IXL uh, is math and, I'm blanking every second, math and reading. Um, Mayon, I actually have to check and see if we still use. I believe we had actually talked about removing this from the budget for this year, um, and I have to double check on that one. Um, iPad educational apps, we, we leave in there as a placeholder um, every year. Typically, we get requests for miscellaneous apps, um, like a teacher will, will request, uh, a, a, say, a, a cursive writing app um, that helps the students with that for 40 students at $6 a piece. Um, any of those requests come out of that number. Uh, Zello software is um, our individual learning plan tracking software. That is actually a ride requirement um, as of last year. Um, so that's our annual subscription cost for that. Um, learning A to Z uh, is another um, like lower grade educational software. It's, a, it's an app based subscription um, that I believe one through four, um, actually a little bit lower than that even is currently using um, liter literacy, uh, heavy literacy focus on that one. Um, Lesson Picks is a replacement for Boardmaker, um, which is a special ed software that provides, um, uh, there's a special name for them, the, the, the picture diagrams um, for, for kids that have trouble with, with speaking and, and composing sentences and stuff like that. Um, Minecraft for Education is a new ad that we've received a lot of requests for, actually. Um, there's a lot of really great content in the fully licensed feature. The kids are absolutely engaged and really want it and love using it. Um, but they build a lot of um, a lot of lessons for teachers, um, and it's a managed classroom with a private server that's secure for the kids that they can they can go on. And when they build, they actually solve math and logic problems and, and stuff like that. Um, so that was definitely something uh, we were looking to add for this year. Uh, Smart Music is is another one for our music program, uh, an annual subscription for for both of our teachers there. Um, Gizmos is, is a math and science assistive learning tool. Um, Zern is, that is science written down there. That's math, sorry. <laughs> that was a typo. Um, Zern is, is an online 
and, and Sonia may be able to speak a little bit more about this one. This, one, this one's newer for us, um, but an online math um, diagnostic and learning program. Uh, and then there's iReady, which is our school-wide yearly diagnostic in, um, in both reading and math. So John, can I ask a question? Am I, am I on here? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me? It's not for you. It's yeah, for uh, Principal Whip. Principal Whip, can you hear me? I can. So I, I think you know my feelings about Achieve 3000 that I, that I expressed last year. Um, do you see any difference this year or I don't want to get in the weeds on it. Yeah, uh, no, but we are using it with different grade levels and um, I, I mean, it is being used. We're using it grades two through eight, seven, six, two through six this year. How is their content? Is it up to date? Are they, or is it, uh, I know, it, it, you know, it's a hard program to keep up to date and a hard program to, uh, you know, are they really doing well with it? The, the people that put it out, I mean. Yeah, the, the, younger, it, the younger grade levels do seem to um, be highly engaged with the content. One of our students, grade three, had the highest achievement in reading in the entire state of Rhode Island. So the, it's a the, better fit in the lower grades. I yeah. agree. Yeah. We have it for the higher grades too? It, we're using it through sixth grade. So the fifth and sixth grade are seventh and eighth um, is where uh, it wasn't necessarily the best fit. And am I seeing there's there we have some new software for uh, uh, for math? Um, Zern is, is Zern. Yep, yeah, Zern is new this year. It was oh. um, used by a couple of people last year. Um, between March and June, a lot of companies gave access to their programs um, when we hit the online learning in March. Um, Zern was one of them, and it goes along nicely with the um, Eureka Math. Um, and it is something that, particularly when kids are at home, it's it's something that well, is used both in school and at home. But it really can help walk them through the instruction and let them go back over the pieces that um, they may not be able to get quite so easily um, if they're at home. So it's a good tool to complement. Uh, the in-person instruction of the teachers. Uh, so it's we're using it as a supplement to engage New York. What grade level is that? K to five. And the, the gizmo, was that uh, that program last year here? here um, last? Gizmo and what was the other one? Generation Genius. So those the two, those are two that we added as part of our um, science. Thank you. Um, so that covers the bulk of our classroom-based software um, that gets actively used by the students every day. Um, the next account there would be professional development and training. I had to make sure I unmuted myself. Okay. Um, so staff um, technology and PD training, um, we left in there at $6,000. Um, this was the same amount as last year, which we had hoped to include um, more active um, security awareness training. We still did manage to do some this year, but we've, we've placed much more of an emphasis on technology tra training. So Google apps in the classroom, um, some of the more specific tools that we've used, and uh, we, we've um, gotten a subscription to a service called um, Otis, uh, which provides Google, Microsoft, Promethean certification courses that teachers can take for free. Um, as well as a, a whole myriad of other just general technology training courses designed for educators. Um, and that we've, uh, we've been finding has a lot of great content in it as well. Um, so again, we, we just wanna keep uh, at least that amount in there for next year to make sure we, we keep that moving forward. Um, 53502 other technical services. Um, so these are largely the other pieces of software, services, subscriptions that we subscribe to that keep things running on the back end or on the administrative side, generally. Um, so Aspen is our biggest cost there, definitely. Um, that's our SIS. It manages everything about all of our kids, so that's not so much of an option. Um, we are looking into ways to save money by by. 
tweaking what modules we subscribe to, um, but that, that's relatively fixed. Um, frontline absence management, um, that, that as well, um, that takes care of absence management as well as our professional growth platform. Um, that's all integrated together in there. Uh, Heartland is, is new to kids. That's, that uh, drives our school lunch program and all the data tracking for that. Tynet is a specialized version of PowerSchool, much like an SIS, but it is what the region uses um, to host all of our, our student data for the special education program um, that, uh, that we pay our local share of. LobbyGuard is our front desk management check-in station. Um, RyLink is the library connection. Um, Board Docs is the system that we all use here. Um, Parent Square is our communication solution, which was new in the budget last year. Um, but that has been such a huge asset at this point that I, I think it's it's well worth it, certainly. No, uh, no questions there. Um, School Spring is something used more on the HR side for job postings. Um, Script was our digital document management platform and delivery service. Um, so that's what did our, our online forms and the start of the year packets, those type of things. And plan board, which is a centralized um, curriculum and standard alignment tracking hub. Um, and this one was new for this year. It is the tool that allows everybody to upload their, their lesson plans essentially and attach them to standards, um, which which everybody in the building can see because we have, have published them as, as the assigned standards for what we do here. Um, this allows us a really good window at the end of the year where we can generate a report that will allow us to see where we were really strong, what we covered well, what we can focus on better next year. Um, so that will be a huge benefit to have that finally tracked all in one place, we're hoping. Um, and at the end, that wraps up that one. Um, so that would leave us at, oh, can you go back up a little? Where were we? Sorry. Oh yeah, we're good with that. All right, so that was other technical services. Looks like I have a hand raised by a school committee member. We do. Uh, that is not a fake hand raise either, is it? That's a true, that is, that's her hand raise. Go ahead, Hannah. Thank you, Patrick. I just wanted to ask, um, Principal Witt, before we got too far away from the student programs, if you could give a little feedback just on how the teachers and or the students feel about using them, like how, what's their effectiveness, things like that. Um, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the ones that are the most engaging and that work um, that are best suited to the curriculum that we are already um, committed to. Uh, it's been something of trial and error to figure out what the best fit, for instance, the moving achieve to the second grade through sixth grade instead of fifth through eighth has, has been a better fit for us. So we're trying to... Um, find the right um, combination. I think one of the things that's been challenging is um, we already were using um, many digital tools, but we're using digital tools differently since March. Um, so we've been looking for things that allow us to jump into more distance learning versus being able to do things that are um, uh, you know, that can be used in, in school all the time. One of the things, um, I mean, I don't think any of us want to have kids on the computer from uh, 8.30 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So figuring out that mix between screen time, what's the appropriate use of digital tools, and figuring out how to make them work best for everybody. Um, so there's some things that we definitely are finding that we like and that we're going to continue moving forward with and other things i think we just keep seeing what products are out there and make adjustments accordingly because um the longer we go on in this more digital world things are changing very quickly and often um i mean it, john has done a wonderful job of um really keeping his eyes open as things develop and that there's um you know new products out there that will help us so, but overall, you would say that the programs that are listed here, at least for this year in the circumstances we're in, um, are definitely ben more beneficial than they are just expenses or just keeping kids on the screen? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. So, Hannah, what I, oh, go ahead, Rita. I uh, just wanted to stay with this focus then. Um, is Jonathan able to, Jonathan, are you able to really monitor like if there are technical problems with any of these platforms, if there's a particular 
you know, software issue with one of them and how much people are using them satisfactorily. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Might have to mute me again, Patrick. Um, so Sonia may have some better insight into that because she goes over a lot of the reports in much more detail. Um, but, but many of these pieces of software, we can monitor on the back end and make sure they're working correctly. Um, a big focus on a lot of the choices that we've made um, is to make sure that it integrates really well with our system, with Aspen, with our Google-based single sign-on, all that kind of stuff, um, just to make it as easy as possible for everybody involved too. Um, so, so that's definitely part of the consideration. Um, so, so we pay attention to all that on the back end. On the front end, it definitely varies app to app, um, but there are a lot of really great tools. Um, iReady probably is the first one that pops into my head because we've been doing that so much lately, um, but we can monitor um, the, or, or the, and the test assist, assist us in doing so. We can monitor um, when the students are taking a test, we can monitor how fast they're going through it. It detects whether they've rushed through the test um, or if they're skipping questions or things like that. So, so there's, besides just the raw data itself, the, the scores on the test that tell you whether or not they're, they're getting anything out of it, we can actually see in a lot of cases how it's being used. Um, are these kids just tabbing through it to get it done and, and skipping over all the important things because that's what they're being told to do? Or are they actually spending time on each question and, and getting into it and, and, and really learning from it, really extracting something back out of that? And, and I mean, I, I, I see a lot of it. I, I don't understand it to the same level that Sonia would, but I would say it's, it's pretty clear that our, our, our kids are not doing things like that. Um, it seems like the based on on some usage that, that that I've I've witnessed myself, the the kids that need to spend more time on certain problems where, where they're struggling, the, the software typically does identify that and it, it presents them new problems and recommendations based on their own unique needs and they're going, they're spending the extra time and, and it's attempting to catch them up to where everybody else is. Um, so so there's definitely a lot of that going on in in various different ways among I would say among every single one of the apps on that list, um, we, we do have a lot of insight as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Does and, and Sonia may definitely have more to add to that as far as, as what she can extract out of that too, well, her observations on it. Um, but, but does that answer your question there? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I, I will just... Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, before we leave the page, I just wanted to note, um, on page eight, the line item was 53301, but it was professional development for staff. And the number went down significantly, like to 6,000. And this number, so there's two PD lines in the budget. What I'm saying is, is that a dis the discrepancy is because they're getting more technical PD than the other professional development? And I think John can correct me if I'm wrong here, but those are separate light items. One is is technology specific professional development, and one is anything else not related to technology. So that was a huge drop. I was curious about that. Now, where is that, Rita? It's on page eight, five three three zero one. And one of the other things is that a considerable amount of our professional development is funded through our um, federal grants, so it's not necessarily reflected. Right. Oh, okay. Okay, so thank you. A, that answered it. doesn't exist. It's just thank you. Rita, we shifted most of our professional development to Title II. Ride approved of um, just about all of our international baccalaureate training in that particular federal grant resource right. area. Wonderful. And thank you. That was that was my and, and I'm glad to see this line too. Right. It has not decreased. If that's no. a, thank it you. Has, it's very much a high value high priority item. Yeah. Title II and Title IV, I started shifting almost all PD um, year one and then year two, most of it, and just about, I would say 75 to 80% of it is federally funded and yeah. syncs beautifully with the objectives at the Department of Ed. Great, thank you. So Principal Whip, just quickly, I think Hannah, I don't know if I, picking up what you uh, what you intended, but principal with, with these digital tools and supplemental programs, do you get input from the teachers? Do you have dialogue with these teachers about specific tools and programs uh, that they feel they need for their class? And how often do you have this dialogue? 
Yep, certainly through PLC meetings and um, just general um, times that we meet with teachers, we get feedback back and forth and the list of things that we've used has changed based on feedback from teachers. Do we have teachers who want these tools and programs that we have not given them to them? So you mean, has somebody asked for something and not gotten it? Mm -hmm. um, there may be a couple of things that have not, that have not um, been funded, but not by and large, we funded the majority of things, um, trying not to have a lot of duplication of effort. So we don't wanna necessarily have two things that do essentially the same thing. Um, and want to make sure that anything we do look at is aligned with our various um, curriculum foci. And I can add to that. Our, our teachers are passionate, dedicated, and they are not shy uh, about advocating for resources for their students. That said, it has been a year of literally shifting from generally an analog instructional space to a fully digital one, uh, one that we can just pivot um, based on obviously COVID-19 and, and you know, uh, peaks in infection and so forth. So it has been a year of, uh, you know, climbing a steep learning curve for all of us, but most especially for our classroom teachers, um, shifting from that analog world to the a almost fully digital world um, with the best of resources and support has still been, um, so many teachers would say it's been a grind and I agree. So, but they're not shy about sharing uh, their needs, wants and um, feedback. And we welcome that, absolutely. They are doing the hardest work. You. Go ahead, Jonathan, are you still going? Um, so I think we're good on that page. You're, you're about ready to be the host now, John. You can do next week. Um, so we got device repairs, um, which is $2,000 we set aside for, for repairs, a lot of which are done in-house um, to save on costs. We just buy the parts directly. Um, technology related supplies, um, so faculty and student supplies, um, we put a little bit more than we would ask for um, in other years, but um, that, that includes spare chargers, headphones, mice, cases for devices, that sort of stuff. Um, we are looking to, uh, um, among some larger purchases in there, we do need a set of adapters for classrooms so that teachers have a little more flexibility when it comes to connecting other devices to their screens. Um, we would like to buy them active styluses for their touchscreen Chromebooks um, next year, which allows them to use it as a whiteboard and write natively in their own handwriting on the screen um, without having to, to rely on some other tool. Um, that would be a, a big benefit for, for distance learning, virtual learning days, um, and, and more of, of the rest, spare charges. Headphones and mice are a big one, um, especially for this year and, and very likely for next because the kids aren't um, able to share them. Um, and then uh, a network kit, test kit and some tools. So that would be um, a network probe, some, some monitoring equipment um, and some electrical monitors for the, um, for the three IDFs to alert us of any issues with power or anything like that going in. Equipment um, is, is the big one that John um, had, uh, where most of our capital comes from and we were discussing before. Um, so there's a few um, items in here that, uh, that are very, definitely very big ticket items compared to some of the rest. Um, so the first one, additional security and alarm upgrades. Um, this came, th this is a necessary upgrade that we need to do at some point in the near future, but there's another immediate benefit um, for, our, for our kind of plan, our daily plan nowadays. It, it relies on us using many more doors in the school, more, more points of entry and exit. Um, so one of the things we started looking at was trying to um, equip three more of the, the rear doors with fob readers so that people can let themselves in without having to issue master keys to everybody. Um, unfortunately, our door controller system is, is out, somewhat outdated um, to the point where it's harder to find the right parts and licenses for, um, but uh, it, it's also at its current capacity. So we would need, besides just the door hardware itself, we would need to spend a significant amount on the back end. Now that system itself, um, is 
I don't have an exact date, but is probably going on about 15 years old, so the, the, the main server that runs all of it. Um, so that is definitely due for replacement sometime soon. Um, so, so we included everything uh, in this in one shot. This would be a replacement of that, that old aging server. This would be replacing the necessary hardware at the current doors to make them compatible with our fobs, um, adding the three additional doors. And this would also include some alarm upgrades um, to alarm some, some doors that are not currently reporting correctly and grant the um, front office a panel that we can install in there where they will actually be able to see a, a list of all doors in the school and it will light up when one of them is held or propped open. Um, so that would be a big security benefit on that side. That's all included in that 20,000 number. Um, gym and stage AV equipment, that's the gymnatorium upgrade, which as John mentioned, um, if, if that works out with the town, they would be moving that over into their budget for this year. Um, but that is, that is uh, essentially phase two of what we started with the renovation project, whereas this year we will um, focus more on the audio, the infrastructure, getting everything cleaned up um, and making it a usable space for community events, um, town meetings, that sort of thing. Um, this will add the additional sound, theater lighting, integration with the house lighting, um, and a high quality projector, um, as well as some additional microphone options so that it becomes a true multi-purpose space that, that equips us for um, community events, movie nights, plays, those sort of things, um, which if, if done properly, we're thinking could actually turn around and become revenue generators, um, which would fund further, further maintenance and upgrades to that space. Um, cameras, uh, we are starting on our camera upgrades for this year, um, but there would be an additional 4,000 that we are asking for in next year's budget um, to include uh, additional battery backups to give them longer operating times when the power goes out and more storage um, so that we'll have uh, a little over a month of footage recorded at that point. Um, we do have battery backups now on most of it. However, um, there are certain areas of the building where the circuits aren't on generators. So this would make it so all cameras and all security appliances are fully on battery backup um, for I believe a minimum of five hours. Um, VoIP phones, this was another one, as John mentioned, that we could defer until next year. Um, this is, is somewhat of an upgrade, um, but it also would um, include a couple of changes that we want to make here, rather than have a locally hosted system, which means there's, there's a server physically running here, which is due for replacement soon, um, and, and is susceptible to outages and, and communications issues. Um, we would put our, our server that controls all of our calling in the cloud um, and replace the phones that are here in the rooms with, with phones that route through the internet to that service. Um, that gives us a lot more flexibility, but it also allows us to pool resources across town, which, which is kind of the theme of the night here. Um, longer term, the, the town hall is, is signing up and, and going with the solution as well. Uh, we expect to move the public safety complex over. Um, and if we have all of our municipal services on the same system and the same plan, um, we can cost share out a lot of the expense there. So that is the one-time cost of hardware upgrades, that 16,000 that's in there, that will do the entire building in one shot, um, in, including installation. Um, and from that point on, our ongoing costs go down um, somewhere between 30 and 40% we're expecting, assuming we go through with that. Um, so again, not a necessary upgrade. It definitely could be deferred if need be, um, but it would be a, a big benefit by the time we do get to, to finally do that. Um, and then the last two line items there are some battery backups for the IDFs. There are a couple older batteries that need to be replaced um, that, are, that are getting there. We have, um, I think on our weakest ones, about seven minutes of backup on our network switches. Um, it's enough time for the generator to kick in, but they are, definitely um, getting getting up there in age, it is, it is time to replace those. Um, our network switches also power all of our access points for the Wi-Fi and our phones. So if those go down, we, we suffer somewhat of a communications outage. Luckily we have the walkie talkies now, but we definitely wanna keep those up and running. Um, and then we included network switch upgrades. Um, and these are planned upgrades, um, which, which we had, had planned on starting, we deferred that from last year, um, but these would be a replacement to 
newer generation um, fully routable switches that give us a lot more security both internally and against anything coming in from the outside um, and it also gives us um, a 60 percent power savings uh, reduction in, in, in the amount of electricity used essentially um, and they um, they are 50 percent faster in terms of what they're able to deliver out to to the endpoints. Um, so it would be a nice, nice upgrade um, to have. It, it would definitely be felt immediately in the classrooms, but we're not struggling yet. What, where we are running up against is time. Our network switches are, are on average six years old. Um, and now is about the time you want to seriously start consider replacing those as well. Um, got a question. Oh, we have a question. Is the line item for cameras? Uh, is, is the line item for cameras is the line item for cameras security related camera they are cameras they are is the answer yes they are okay and that is all from the safety subcommittee safety report um, yep definitely that was derived from from the planning that we and discussions we had there um they're, they're all for security cameras these would cover one or two additional areas where either the coverage was there but maybe there was a slight blind spot in in, in an open area out back of the school or something like that um and one or two additional ones for the front door to make sure we have good coverage there as well um and as well as um sorry uh hard drives we, we, we'd add on additional storage and a follow-up question where is that footage stored um that footage is stored here in the school there is an encrypted um server downstairs in the basement that is inaccessible by anybody else um and that is archived there currently we have just about three weeks i believe of of footage that is backed up um and if that wraps the equipment section up I will move on to technology related hardware. Um, definitely another another big line item. So we have Chromebooks um, for pre-K to one. Um, we we do expect the REAP grant to, which at the very end, I don't know if John included that, but I did subtract back out, but we expect the REAP grant to be applied towards this purchase. Um, this is uh, exploring the option of moving our pre-K, kindergarten and first graders off of iPads and onto Chromebooks. Um, it's gotten to the point where all of our apps are compatible with both fully. Um, there is much more, uh, there are many more benefits to the management side of things when we have everybody on the same system um, and the teachers would be using the same operating system that the students would as well across all grade levels now. Um, so it, it brings a little bit more consistency in at that level. Um, but um, it also enables us to do a couple other cool things. So uh, at, the, at the youngest grade levels, it would give them the ability to log in very, very easily in one step with a QR code to the device. And that would also log them into every other app they need simultaneously. There would never be a password that, that a kindergarten needs to remember and type in ever again. It would all be um, very seamless um, and linked to our single sign-on. Mm. Um, so that, that includes 60 devices for those grade levels. Yep. Um, Jonathan, if I may, you meant Chrome pads. Sorry, but I, 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 I did put Chromebooks, but yes, that, that is that is an important distinction. Um, we would be looking at touchscreen devices for Thank those you. grade levels, yeah. po possibly with optional um, add-on keyboards, but but they would be touchscreen devices first for that level. Um, so we're also looking at a Windows laptop fresh. Can you? Sorry. Thanks. Um, we're also looking at a Windows laptop fresh, refresh. Um, so we put 10 of them in there. That is um, some of our front office who are working on some older um, desktops that haven't been upgraded in a long time and um, replacements for other faulty devices. We have, we probably have two or three um, staff members right now that are using broken computers, um, sometimes physically broken. Uh, I, I believe our our principal has gone without a, a working speaker in her laptop for a very long time. And uh, and I do have to admire the commitment that that we have to making sure the students have the best stuff first. Um, but we, we definitely wanna make sure that, uh, that we have good working technology for everybody here. Um, additional faculty Chromebooks. We actually ended up um, using a few extras. Some of those are loaners handed out to the daily subs. Um, some of those are 
for TAs that have taken a much more active role than, than some of us could have ever expected this year. Um, but but we, we found ourselves using all of the faculty Chromebooks that we bought last year and then some. Um, so this will fill in that gap. Room PCs um, are, are probably the next biggest um, item that we're looking at going to. These would be dedicated PCs that live in each classroom attached to the Promethean board. And, and we, we are trying to standardize as much as possible across every classroom. That, that is, is something that we've found has, has been an asset as teachers are more mobile. Walking into each room and knowing that everything is identical is, is just that much less for them to think about. Um, so what we'd like to do is have a, a PC that is built into the board um, that will essentially offload a lot of the classroom management tasks. Um, so it can run some of the software, it can host the Google Meet, it will be what the camera and, and the secondary screen, if necessary, connects directly to. And that way the teacher laptop doesn't get tied up trying to do that. Um, I just create some awkward situations where, where you're trying to multitask and see some of the kids that are at home, also pay attention to the kids in school and share your screen and control a class all, all on the same laptop. It, it definitely, or the same laptop in Promethean board, it would definitely be a big benefit for them to have that, that extra device. Um, the, sorry, I lost my place there. Um, the common, common area and conference room upgrades. Um, so those are, are standard upgrades that we're looking at um, for the conference room, which, which doesn't have much in it at all. It has not been used as much um, this year, but mostly probably because we stripped a lot of the technology out of it as well and, and put it back into the classrooms. Um, so this would at least equip the space for when we can start using it in, in maybe teleconferences or smaller meetings um, so that we have a, a nice screen and a computer in there to actually host calls. Um, the commons itself, the projector up there um, broke, the power supply has actually gone on it. And the quote we got was just about the cost of a whole new projector. Um, so we are, are looking at replacing that as well in there, um, as well as some other wiring and, and smaller upgrades there uh, in those spaces. Uh, 3D printers is, um, is something that we have definitely needed for a little while. Um, I, I know um, we, we, we loaned them out um, to Cyrus and, and he did an excellent job getting them up and running. Um, so we, that, that was definitely appreciated, but, um, but, the, but the, we, we are, about time for, for some new ones, um, no doubt. They, they have some, some lingering issues, mostly just due to wear and tear. They've, they've had a long life here and it's, it's due time. Um, since we put this together, we've actually found some more affordable 3D printers that may, may reduce that by about half. Um, uh, FirstNet phone refresh also includes a couple hotspot devices in there as well, um, but it is time to start upgrading those. And classroom wiring and updates, um, we left about $250 in there. What we would like to do is to certain key areas of the building that are very high traffic, run a second access point. Um, we're finding that if there are 60 students in close proximity to only two access points, um, well, the normal experience is just fine. If they all start to do, um, say, a Google Meet at the same time, which, which we actually do have happen, that many kids can get into breakout rooms and, and work in, in the same room, but with distance kids. Um, when they all start doing video streaming, we, we notice a little bit of lag here. Um, and, and we think that will help a lot in solving that issue, as well as clean up some other things. There are some some power cords dangling here and there. There are some um, some old boards that we never took down. The smart boards that were that were defective. So we want to remove that and and mount the Prometheans back in their place if those haven't been done yet. Um, so that will complete the remaining classroom upgrades. Okay. Mike Rocha, do you have a question? I do for Jonathan. Just to uh, go back for one second under the fifty six three hundred five. Those phones that you referenced in there, um, that's replacing the phones that are in the classrooms as well as the office, that's everything? Is that what you're referring to in this, this line item? Yes, that would be everything in the building. And you say that it works off of the cloud? It's cloud it does. Cloud. So you may have said this and I may have missed it, but what happens when the internet goes down and the cloud's not available? No, that, that is a great question, definitely. Um, and, and it's something we, we did think about in that case. Um, as of right now, we are actually having more phone outages than internet outages lately. 
Um, so I, either way, I, I think it would actually be a more reliable communications route. Um, but that said, we are, we, that would include installing a cellular backup um, with an antenna on the roof that's pointed directly over at the first net tower um, based out of the church. So in the event that our main internet lines were to go down, certain communications, the alarm security system, HVAC control and um, remote access for the cameras and telephone, those would all switch over to the cellular modem instead automatically. So there shouldn't actually be an outage in that event. Okay, so we have a backup to that. All Correct. Right. Thank you. Um, that leaves. Here we go. Technology software. Oh, that's a lot of pages. Um, okay. So our. Oh, can you mute me, Patrick? Um, it's weird being in the same room with myself. Uh, so Microsoft Cloud Licensing Agreement, this covers our office, Windows, device management, some aspects of our single sign-on, and um, it will also include some licensing for some cloud apps we use to handle FTP traffic and stuff like that this year. Um, Mojo Help Desk uh, is, is new for this year. Um, this is our replacement for the old, not as great help desk system that we, we trialed out at the beginning, but... Um, but th this one has been a huge asset. We've stood this one up and um, are already routing all IT department requests through it, as well as um, main office and attendance emails and voicemails now um, are getting all routed through this system. So it creates a, a ticket immediately upon any communication, provides a receipt to the person who has submitted that, indicating when, we'll, when they should hear back from us, um, and then immediately starts an internal audit trail timer and, um, and full set of documentation. So at any given point, any communication, any inquiry request, anything like that that's coming into the school can be tracked centrally by, by everybody involved. Um, and, and we all know who's left off. Um, it's, it's already, we're already getting some pretty good feedback um, about things like, like attendance notifications now going to multiple people immediately instead of just one. Um, so we think that's been a huge help so far. Um, general audit tool is, an, is a, an account and device management utility that we use. It integrates very heavily into Google um, environment um, and it can run analytics and security scans and provide basic management functions and automations around um, like, like setting up new students, rostering students into Google Classroom, that sort of stuff. Um, that is a hugely valuable tool that saves us a lot of time. Um, and it is also, um, uh, they, they also now bundle in at no additional cost, really. It's, it's part of the same package, um, a teacher assist management application, which, which helps them in the classroom, which, which we're starting to try to, um, to work through and pilot now, um, but it allows them to like, do things like uh, lock down the internet for class if the kids aren't supposed to be browsing other websites, if, if there is something that they're just supposed to be focusing on for that time, um, or push out content so the uh, teacher can open up um, open up a specific web page, uh, click and with with the click of one button, make that same web page open on every single kid's screen simultaneously, whether they're in the classroom or at home. Um, so that's also a cool value add that that um, that has been helpful as well so far in our testing. Um, and then the last couple are, aren't as interesting. HP Enterprise Foundation support. That's our our server support and maintenance agreement. Um, that just covers the physical hardware in case of any major malfunction or failure. Um, they, they have on-site um, on technicians that would come out, help diagnose it and provide the replacement parts if necessary. Um, Mosul MDM is our iOS and macOS management software. Um, similar to what General Audit Tool does for Google, Mosul does for Apple devices. Um, this, if we do end up switching away from Apple devices, I, I would note, would not end up being a purchase for next year, obviously. Um, web hosting for our website and AWS uh, Azure hosting storage. Um, we're in the middle of migrating a lot of our backups to a new hosting provider. Um, right now, it's, it's all provided by um, a third party called Barracuda, who raised their prices again on us. Um, and we, quite frankly, weren't getting enough for the money there. Um, so our new costs, uh, we're still evaluating which ones we're going to go with, but 
max out at around $80 a month, uh, whereas before we were paying a little over $325 a month, I believe, for that one. Um, and that, that backs up all of our important data, pretty much. If, 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 even if there is a local backup, it eventually gets mirrored up to the cloud somewhere, encrypted fully and, and stored securely in, in Glacier storage, cold storage, where it's, it's really safe and secure. Um, that covers us for everything across the board. And that's about it. Um, I will note. <laughs> yeah, I, I will note that uh, that obviously, like I said, if if we go with the iPads, Mosul would not be included. Um, the iPads, if we did decide to go with that, um, I, I think it's it's looking like it might make more and more sense every day. But we have a lot more discussions to go through with the teachers and students and, and families. Um, if we do do that, there is some um, buyback value left in our current fleet of iPads, um, so we could expect some value return there somewhere, um, somewhere in the five thousand dollar range most likely um and there is a little bit of buyback value from some of the other windows laptops we might be retiring to replace with those other other miscellaneous hardware so so wherever we have the option oh and the voip phone system well well we are speaking of deterring deferring that until next year um our current system would would also have some buyback value left in it so we'll we'll reclaim that wherever possible absolutely Wow, thank you so much, Jonathan. Now you know why everyone, I call him the best IT director in the state. He truly is remarkable. Uh, we all know that the human resource, the teacher has the most impact on student learning. However, in 2021, our tech tools um, definitely undergird everything that we do. So Jonathan, thank you. You are brilliant, hardworking. Um, I, I will definitely get you some bulk Swedish fish, which is his uh, guilty pleasure of choice. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Jonathan and uh, John McNamee, our two professionals that make our job easier. Thank you very much. We are at uh, public input on the agenda, public input on agenda items and topics for future agendas. Um, Obviously, we have public input throughout the meeting here. So if you have anything, just raise your hand or put it in the chat and uh, get a hand up. Go ahead. Is that Roger? Go ahead, Roger. Okay. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Yep. Um, just probably not a, a popular subject, but, you know, given that the uh, student enrollment has dropped once again and given that a number of years ago like in the early 70s there were 500 kids in the school and that was before two additions were built and now we're down to i believe 221 and that's down from the previous year uh, my sense is that based on that uh, that perhaps the school budget should be level funded for FY22 over FY21. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't even begin to tell you where to make cuts. I mean, some of them, I have my own ideas, but I'll keep them to myself. But it's, it's just a thought uh, that I think I, people have asked me about this. And the question keeps going, why does the cost of the school keep going up? when the student enrollment keeps going down? And it's a valid question. So I will leave that to you. Thank you, Roger. As you know, I'm doing everything I can to boost that, that uh, attendance in our school. Um, anything else from the public? Anything else from the committee? Anything else from our professor? Go ahead. Someone's um, talking. Good eye, Chairman. It's Go Rita. ahead, Rita. Yeah, I just I just have to make a statement about the increase in healthcare. Seven percent. Everything else is two percent. It just seems so out of line in this day and age. You know, two percent for salary increase. We have two, you know, a moderate increase in a lot of our benefits. And but this seems so much for I guess this is a personal concern, but such an increase for what we're getting. Um, but 
I know it's the trust issue and they have to negotiate that, but I just think that's disturbing. Um, I guess just a comment, unless you have anything, John. Yeah, so because we are, we're, we're kind of pooled with the trust. So some of the um, catastrophic claims get kind of mediated through all the members within the trust, but there, there is some impact on um, obviously uh, our usage. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, in some years we've had, uh, if you recall in the past, we've had 12 to 16% increases. And um, those fluctuations were certainly um, intolerable. And um, then of course last year we had a decrease. So it's, uh, it's a tough one because it's, uh, a lot of times it, it depends. I mean, you could get, um, you know, two or three catastrophic claims, which kind of drive up you know, that premium cost. And um, I know that in, in my other district, we, one year we had like eight catastrophic claims and we couldn't figure out, you know, what was happening, but um, that, that, but that has a significant impact. So we're going to know more about that when we get the final results from, uh, from the trust. But right now, I think they sent that number out to all the members to, in the trust. So that may be, you know, based on our usage, we could be down below the the seven percent, which I think would be a good good sign. But um, at this point, we're just taking our lead from what the trust has put out there, sure. uh, just to get it in the budget at this point in time. But sure. I, I agree with you; it's a it's a tough one. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and uh, then just one last comment for Jonathan. Yeah, um, it, it's rock star quality as. Um, you know, we can see, I just want to put in a plug though, if you can, if you're going to fix the little bit of lag for the students, can you get the principal a laptop that works? Just a little plug. Definitely. And Thank you. Thank you. Awesome work. Both, both John's. Awesome work. Thank you so much. And I forgot to thank John McNamee. He did text me to remind me that I forgot to, no, he didn't do that. John, thank you so much. Too late, Laurie, it's too late. <laughs> so I just want to, before we close, remind the school committee members that we're, we have authority over three things, making policy, the superintendent's contract, hiring and firing her, and the budget. So we can add anything we want with three votes, or we can take anything out, anything out with three votes. Um, so this is the only three things we can do. Um, we've had some of the, uh, our other responsibilities taken away from us. So this is a time to look at the budget and, uh, you know, if we have a vision of what we want to do, uh, we can affect the budget. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody's reminded of that. That's on this committee. Anything else before we adjourn? All right. I thank you everyone for spending some time. We're going to do this again on February 10th and uh, we'll let everybody know about it. This meeting was taped. Uh, we'll be on our website soon and we'll send that out to the public so they can hopefully get more acquainted with what's going on here at the school. I will consider a vote to adjourn. Do I have a motion? So moved. The second. Second. Roll call, please, Mariah. Ariana. Aye. Anna Aya. Aye. Rita Cunningham. Aye. Mike Rocha. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. Thank you, folks. Have a good night. Good night, all. Aye. Good night. Great teamwork, everybody.